Football on Off the Ball. With William Hill, you can boost your winnings on the Sunday game with new BetBuilder Extra. Only with William Hill. Download the app today. 18 plus gamblingcare.ie. This is News Talk. You're welcome back. We are looking ahead to the weekend's football across channel. The Premier League continues. The WSL gets up and running. We've got Phil here. We've got Kathleen here. We've got Cullum here. Folks, a very good evening to all of you. Uh, let's have a look at last week's results and who you got. Jer, top of the list. Kathleen, top of the list. Mick, top of the list. And Shane, top of the list. You all got three points. Well done. I hope you're happy. <laughs> Kathleen, you delighted with that result? That sounds vaguely like the come dine with me meme where it's yes. like... <laughs> I'm very happy. Delighted I mean, for your success. It wasn't it wasn't a great start to the season so far, both personally and professionally. So it was nice to have a win. Right, that sounds uh, mildly bleak, but uh, we we'll, <laughs> might come back to that at some point. Uh, let's have a look at the overall season standings. Jer is top of the leaderboard, and thank God he's not here. He's there, two points clear of Shane, who's in second, who's on eleven points. Mick in third, and I'm there uh, in fourth, alongside Will and Kathleen on eight points. Down at the bottom are Phil and Cullum. What's going on, lads? Early days, yes. Like people are starting to ask me, uh, you know, too good to go down. They stop asking you who you got. They don't <laughs> ask you anymore. <laughs> you, they just tell me I'm making a hames of it. So it's uh, it wasn't actually that bad last week. What did I? I don't think anyone had. Nobody had Forrest to win. No, I think I was the only one that had Forrest mm. to score at Anfield. But I obviously didn't envisage Liverpool wouldn't score. Didn't we all laugh at John Duggan for predicting two all in Aston Villa versus Everton? Oh, we, yeah. we chortled in here, yeah. And uh, ultimately, he got zero points, and he was he was wrong. But uh, for a moment, he was right. Yeah. When Calvert Lewin hits the crossbar at the end, <laughs> he also picked Tottenham to win three 0 as uh, Mick has just reminded me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Calvert Lewin. Well, to be fair, if it wasn't for that John Duran wonder strike, he possibly would have been. Yeah. Correct. So, um, thinking of you, John, you're out there somewhere, and uh, we might get you into the studio some Friday morning. I'm sure. Can we focus on a uh, Cullum being bottom of the table? Because I feel like yeah, this is something on? that he will be annoyed about, and he's sitting there pretending that he does not have a care in the world. Your tiny trophy might be going elsewhere this year. For me, there's no problem at all. No problem. <laughs> it's uh, what are we? September. So I'm still wearing t-shirts. He, he you know, We have a whole jacket season to go through. Fleece, yeah, sweater season first. Uh, shirts. Back to t-shirts. Back to t-shirts. And we'll see where we are. Then we're back to t-shirts, right? right. Yeah. That's my guarantee to you. If you recall, like this time last year, I'm sure I was hovering below at the, at yeah. the end, kind of West Ham 2002 3 style. Topless, in fact. And who was there then? <laughs> uh, Michael Carrick, Joe Cole, uh, Jermaine Defoe, mm-hmm. and other such footballers from that era. Yeah. I don't know why down the clock there by continuing to name the West Ham squad from that era because it was it was a great squad, you know? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't really matter at the moment. Like, Jer can have his fun at the moment. Yeah. That's fine. I'm, I'm actually happy for Jer. Yeah. I'm so happy you worked yeah. out for him. And I'm happy for you too. Yeah. No, thanks very much. I appreciate that, Colin. Let's have a look at what our predictions are for the big game of the Premier League this weekend. It is Manchester City versus Arsenal and it's an even split between draws and Manchester City predictions. Uh, Colm, you're going for a one-all, as am I. Uh, Mick is going for a nil-all oh, yeah. and Nathan's going for a one-all. Meanwhile, super fan of Arsenal Football Club, Kathleen McNamee has turned her back and uh, stabbed him in the back and uh, predicted a Manchester City win as is uh, Ger John, Phil Chain and Will. Confident in Manchester City, folks. I wouldn't say confident. I don't think it's going to be a very good game, to be honest. Um, last season wasn't Arsenal, obviously, coming off the back of the the nil all draw in Bergamo. I can see them setting up similar similar way to the way they went against Tottenham, where like they're so good defensively, and even if you get a penalty against them, that like what Davaraya did was unbelievable. But it's not the first time he's done that this season. You think the the Ollie Watkins save as well. I think, yeah, it'll just be one one goal settles it. It wouldn't surprise me if Arsenal nick something from a set piece or something, but City will have most of the control and whether they can carve out that opportunity for Haaland, that's the challenge. Yeah, I do think, and this is not based on any science, that last week when we were looking at Tottenham against Arsenal, I think we all predicted a bit of a thriller because mm-hmm. that's what you tend to get between Tottenham and Arsenal and it did not deliver that whatsoever. So I wonder, because we're all expecting a replica of the two games in the Premier League last year between City and Arsenal. Could we actually have a good game? Could we have an exciting open game? It doesn't look like Arsenal are no. setting up for an exciting <laughs> no. open game, though. You look at the game last night, and like I was texting you during it, and I don't know where our chances are coming from. Yes, they're so solid defensively, but where are the great goal chances? Who is the person that's going to create that moment of magic? I don't think Arsenal have that player 
at the moment. Maybe Havertz will come into his own at some stage. Maybe Jesus will do something. Maybe Martinelli will actually stop being target. scared of his own shadow and actually hit the target. But that's they're all big ifs. Whereas you look at City and they have a Haaland. They have people that can hit the back of the net. I just I don't know where we're going to create chances against City because I think they will set up very, very well against us. We'll be able to go toe-to-toe with them defensively, but we won't be the ones to create the moment of magic. Um, and like you said about the set pieces, Arsenal concentrated so much on the set pieces. They are quite bad last night. Like <laughs> Declan Rice ballooning <laughs> uh, a free kick uh, from uh, over the left sideline yeah. about 10 metres past the, the, the crossbar. You know, it's it something that Arteta points. has put a lot of focus on, but it, and it was successful last year, but I just haven't really seen that much evidence of it this year yet. Mm. What do you reckon? Yeah, like I, I thought in my lifetime we'd never see the, the boring, boring Arsenal back. You know, this is the George Graham, Tony Adams, Steve Ball days where like 1-0 to the Arsenal and uh, he's turned them into this incredibly defensively solid side and it's hard to believe. Like, remember when Arsene Wenger kept inciting the same player repeatedly and he had a load of them in the same squad and then Mikel Arteta... Midfielder created, yeah, <laughs> not great M- defensively. Mikel Arteta inherited <laughs> that squad and he kind of slowly turned them into this like really tough team to break down. Um, and like they both had nil alls during the week but they're widely different types of nil alls mm. so Man City is one of the best scoreless draws I've seen in a long time and Arsenal last night like like that was like a game of football manager that skips right to the end like, <laughs> like there was like fucking three chances um, I, I, I have a one all draw it was nil all last season I just don't think they're going to repeat it nil all but I do think it'll be a draw right yeah I, I think it'll be I, I I completely agree with like everything you said there, Kathleen. And like, I'm not looking forward to it that much, but I think fatigue will actually help this be a little bit more open because Arsenal have to travel and play a day later, so they may may not be as solid as they have been the last week. Yeah, and City didn't score the Etihad. Was the first time in a long time they haven't scored the Etihad. It was and the, the last time. second time in 42 home right. games in Europe under Guardiola that okay. they failed to score. And the yeah. last time they lost at the Etihad was November 2022 Brentford. to the side that they beat last weekend. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's it's good point. And I also think the fatigue issue that just will inform Arsenal to sit back. Well, different. that, yeah, you see, <laughs> that's the other side of it that they'll we'll just play uh, bank of four and two very much sixes and hopefully Martinelli won't l- any longer be afraid of a shadow. Like, yeah. I think if he had scored last night, Martinelli, then he opens up to being back to the player that do you remember Nathan was saying a few years ago, like this guy could be world class? Remember he had a debate with Daniel Harris on Breakfast a few years ago that like Gabriel Martinelli's world class, like. Mm-hmm. And I I could see Nathan's point at the time. And I would always have the instinct to play Martinelli in an Arsenal team if everyone's fit. But he desperately needs a goal the way that Marcus Rashford scored last weekend and then followed up with two more. Yeah. I remember Klopp used to always talk about Martinelli. And Martinelli in a Klopp team could be world class. Why do you think that? Because what I'm saying is they they would be more aggressive offensively where he would get more chances. Do you think that Martinelli doesn't uh, fare well if it, there's too much pressure on him to create proactively? Yeah, like I think, like I'm using Liverpool as an example because Klopp used to just rave about him all the time and mm. you kind of, the way he talked about him sometimes you think, is he going to try and sign him? But if he played on the left of, say, where that, like that Mane position, mm. just the amount of chances they create, he would score a hat full of goals and then obviously the more goals you score the more confidence and then that's how you turn into the, the player like the, there's definitely like a he's a serious player but it's yeah they've definitely become a more solid team they're like defences tend to win titles uh, but it didn't work last season they came up short yeah. uh, I have a question there for the fashion twins and Arsenal supporters <laughs> um, would you start Raheem Sterling at the Etihad for retribution reasons alone. We're, two weeks in a row we're talking Raheem Sterling and his importance to Arsenal. No. Because? Because he's not in Arsenal's best 11. Or he's not match fit. Because he's not in Arsenal's best 11. Oh. Or, and or is he match fit, so it seems. Your, who, your, your front three when everyone's fit is Saka, obviously. Havertz. Obviously, it, well, where's he playing though? Because he, he well, plays... Because Odegaard's not fit, he's not playing yeah. in the front three. But when everybody's fit, okay, it's yeah, Saka, yeah. Havertz, Trossard slash Martinelli. Trossard. No, no Jesus? Would you give no, Trossard Jesus. more of a chance? He yeah, yeah. I, I would. Uh, I would start Trossard at the weekend, to be honest. But I can understand why Martinelli would be started in a game against Manchester City. I um, so doesn't really like starting Trossard at all. But whenever no. he comes on, he looks dangerous. But I'm like, is that just because he's coming on and he has a point to prove? 
and, and bodies um, are tired and there's more space potentially. He's a better finisher than Martinelli. I'm not loving Gabriel Jesus in the setup at all. I think because of Havertz's injury, he's going to have a lot more. Havertz's injury, Odegaard's injury. He's going to have yeah. a lot more football to play because Havertz has dropped back <laughs> yeah, into I, midfield. I prefer Havertz up top. So do, do I, you? The only Most, thing is, yeah, we, like we did a piece last week uh, on Germany uh, during the international break, and apparently Havertz had played a lot of midfield during the international break and looked amazing. Mm. So he has played there recently. Back into that. Eight and a half, was that the terrible phrase we've been using for Havertz last season? He'd been playing that position again for Germany and and looked really good. So his confidence is still up, but I just prefer him as a number nine for Arsenal. Uh, Jesus, from Arsenal's perspective, they are hoping, I presume, that he's rusty as opposed to this being some sort of indication of how he's going to play for this season. So he's very poor against Atalanta. Uh, I think your point about uh, boring, boring Arsenal is a really good one because... When George Graham won the title twice with Arsenal, it was 79 points and 83 points as boring, boring Arsenal. That is not going to come anywhere near yeah. good enough to, to winning this, this this Premier League title or anything of this era. And it goes back to the game at the Etihad last season where Arsenal probably have a few regrets about not going for that a little bit more. Now, when you look back at that game, uh, Haaland had a big chance and Nathan Ake had a great chance from a corner uh, and Manchester City probably could have won that game even the way Arsenal set up. So I'm not actually sure there was much of a point in Arsenal setting up the way that they set up. I think they could easily have been beaten 1 or 2 nil that day anyway. And I think, generally speaking, the boring, boring Arsenal is not going to win the Premier Sorry. League for them this season. Arsenal aren't going to win the Premier League until we have an out-and-out striker. I well, uh, genuinely believe that. Well, Watching us play, we don't have someone who will consistently create chances, who will consistently score. And I don't think any of the players that are there currently are going to develop into that. Yes, it's great to have lots of options in terms of having lots of different people who will score. But it doesn't feel like <clears throat> that we're going to move on and be a team that can go run out three, four goals yeah. against lower sides, get a couple of goals against middling sides and be comfortable. It feels like we're going to have to like doggedly go at this for the rest of the season. And it's like <laughs> three, four weeks in. I think Arsenal can win the league with this squad, assuming they get Odegaard back into the team before they start to drop a significant amount of points. I think it draws a very good result for them on Sunday. I think they can navigate the Champions League being boring Arsenal for sure because of the new format. And I think that's probably one of the pitfalls of the new format is we're going to see an increasing amount of games like we saw against Atalanta yeah, last night. But I don't I don't know how much of the commentary you heard or saw because you're obviously on air whenever the game was finishing up. But I was really frustrated listening to the commentary and the post-match analysis because I was like, Arsenal should be really happy with what they did here tonight. You know, it was a strong defensive performance. This is, this is good for them. This is the level that they're at. And I'm like, no, we should be... I know Atalanta are a really good team, but if we want to be winning the Premier League... You should be going to teams like Atalanta and you should at least be putting in decent chances. Mm. You know, like, yeah. it, it wasn't the sort of game that you were watching where you are like, oh, there was three or four opportunities there where we should have scored. There was the Martinelli chance was probably one of the better he ones. He had two very good chances. Yeah. And uh, Stack obviously tested the goalkeeper from a, a free kick. But it didn't actually feel like we were going to score watching it. Yeah. And it was frustrating that that's the way that people see Arsenal, that everyone, like Rio Ferdinand, everyone that was on comms was just like, oh yeah, this is this is Arsenal's level. But I, I yeah, I'm not sure if I necessarily go along with that. I, I think it's just such a long season. Yeah. And I think especially in the Champions League, you can feel your way into this because you don't, like, like we'll know a lot more maybe in a year's time and maybe I'll be eating my words at the end being like geez they should have tried to win every game because the seeding is terrible and they've got a, a nightmare draw in the, in the knockout stages I, I just think that given the injury situation now especially with Odegaard and the strain it's putting on a couple of their attacking pieces and Jesus not looking at his best I think that was an okay result last night I think a draw on Sunday would be a good result you get through this period get to the other end of the other, the next international break potentially Odegaard comes back we'll see what happens there and then I think Arsenal could be in a in a good position uh, the the one thing I would say just with re- regards to this Sunday is I do think if we see that De Bruyne might not be playing and Odegaard is definitely not going to be playing I think Odegaard is a bigger loss to this Arsenal team than De Bruyne is to Manchester City now De Bruyne 100%. is obviously the better player Has I'm not questioning that whatsoever I just think, who did they bring on for him the last night? Gundogan. They also have Foden coming off the bench, Doku coming off the bench against Inter Milan. The wealth of options they have in that specific position are just far exceed what Arsenal have, where they have a Havertz, who I love, but who's not an out-and-out Odegaard replacement. So that's my one concern. Yeah, um, a few things there. Like I wonder if Martinelli had converted one of those chances, would you be happy enough at last night's, well, not so much performance, but result and be like, well, okay, now I get what they're doing because that's two one nils in a row away from home. Like, I think it was this close to being an incredibly successful week for Arsenal. Yeah, that's probably fair. I don't know. I just, 
I didn't feel particularly comfortable watching that entire game that we were going to score, that we were going to make a chance that was going to be scoreable. And I think that I I do get what you're saying, that it is a time to manage, especially with Odegaard not being mm. there. But also, it Arsenal feel like a team, and no matter how much Arteta goes on about you know creating mentality and making sure players are always on and all that sort of stuff, they feel a little bit frail in that exactly what we said about Martinelli, it feels like he needs a goal. He needs Mm. a score so that he's not jumping around the place all the time. And I feel that's the case for like a lot of players on the Arsenal side. Saka is the only one that I would look at and say confidently he could go two months without scoring a goal. But if a (laughs) perfect opportunity was put on a plate in front of him, you'd be fairly confident that he'll take it. Um, So that's why I'm concerned. Like if we... If we get through the next couple of weeks without Odegaard and we do get the draw at the weekend, probably we'll reflect on it and be like, that was grand. I just don't know where we're kicking on from here. That's my concern. Yeah, it's a fair point. It's a fair point. I think the the one level of improvement is just Jurian Timber and Calafiori when he starts to play. But the defence was the best in the league last year. So you're talking hashtag marginal gains in the defensive department, unfortunately. Uh, we bring Lee Phelps in from William Hill to look ahead to the weekend. Lee, how are you getting on? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, listening to you guys avidly, trying to think, am I on the right track here? I, I agree with everything you've said, though. I think, uh, yeah, really, really looking forward to the game. Uh, Man City, are slight favourites, but it's just whether, like, what you're talking about there about the Arsenal defence, whether that, whether that is the the key thing in this game. Are the scores kept down like they were last season? Um, but yeah, it's it's fascinating. I think I think Man City have just got the edge in this match. Yeah, I think if you're picking an edge for one of the two teams, it's definitely Manchester City that certainly the people involved in, in our department here are picking. What what for you is the reason why you think they have the edge? Well, I just think the goal scoring side of it, as you guys were saying, and I think without Odegaard as well, it's a big miss. I think you, exactly what you guys said. My reading of this game was that, look at last year, City didn't score a goal against Arsenal in the, uh, in, the in the league. Obviously, they scored one in the in the Community Shield. But very low-scoring matches, you know, the, draw is a big player. I just think the scoring potential that City have and the fact that Arsenal had that extra day in Europe and yep. City have had an extra day's rest. That all has to come into it because you're playing at the very, very highest level here. So I just think, you know, as you guys have been saying, that the, the, the missing Arsenal side is that ability to score from nothing. Maybe a set piece, like you said, it, you know, that, that that fair enough. You could see maybe an Arsenal sneaking one. I think they will set up like, an, like a George Graham side. Mm-hmm. I think they'll be more than happy to come away from this game with a point Absolutely. Because if they don't, if they lose, it's five points between them. And I know we're very early in the season. I know there's a lot of water to go under the bridge yet. But I just think it's that scoring potential. I think they're well matched as teams if they're absolutely at full strength. Yeah, Erling Haaland, we know how he started the season. Seems to be even better. His, his, you know, his record against Arsenal, he's scored two and he's assisted two in four games. He's on, he's on fire, isn't he? So I think he has to go into your thinking around this, that he is somewhere going to get a chance if he gets a chance more than likely could put it away so that's it really and look but the but the odds are similar to that you know man city is 17 to 20 just a touch of odds on the draw is five to two which will be attractive to a lot of people and arsenal priced up at seven to two i think it's one of those though if you don't want to pick a result then something like the bet builder is the way in here because you can you can look at all the things we've just talked about and add them into a mix you want to, I think you want to be low on the goals. I think you want Haaland involved somehow. I think Arsenal will probably find it quite difficult to contain City at times. And when you look back at those games last season, they do tend to have more yellows than City. Disciplinary-wise this season, I think they've had 11 yellows and one red. Uh, City are lower than that on the disciplinary table. So I wouldn't be against picking an Arsenal player to get a card. Gabriel Jesus has had a couple of cards against him recently. Thomas Partey, another one. He's had two cards in three games against City. I think I'll have it all on to contain them as well. So I put a bet builder together, which was under 2.5 goals. It's Thomas Partey to be shown a card, and it's Erling Haaland to either score or assist. That comes out at 15 to 2. Uh, you get a, a 50% boost on this game on the app and on our uh, on our website as well. So that takes it over, to, over 11 to 1. I think that kind of re- listening to what you guys have said and kind of how I think the game will go, none of those things that I've just said sound like overly surprising, but put together, 
gets you a decent price. And uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of Impact Sub. I think it's got the bosses scratching their heads a little bit because uh, there's there's plenty of punters taking advantage of this. So when your player goes off on certain markets, uh, the player coming on obviously um, replaces him and carries the bet on as well. Uh, John Duran has been the absolute epitome of this mm. so far. I think he's scored three, assisted and had cards coming on as a sub. So basically, Ollie Watkins goes off, Duran comes on, and your bet carries on on Watkins. So same here. So when if Haaland goes off, and if Thomas Partey goes off, the players coming on carry those on. So, yeah, that's what I like. And then you don't have to nail your colours to the mass on a result, because I'm not quite sure. Yeah, and I think uh, we're definitely not quite sure what is going to happen in, in this. I think we haven't been 100% sure for the last few weeks either. When we look at our charity bet, Lee, uh, yeah. we are not doing overly well. I think we're... Oh, from three, are we? Yeah, from three. But look, there's time. There's plenty of time. It's what This is what Arsenal will be saying if they lose on Sunday. <laughs> there's time. It's early in the season. All you need is one big winner and we can, you know, we're, we're back in front. So I guess the question is, do we go Do we go for an, a, a result? And I know looking at your predictions, it's, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a line between draw and Man City. There's not a lot of love for Arsenal. So Man City at 17 to 20, we could go for it. Don't know how confident we are. I think it's a reasonable bet. Or we could go a little bit more adventurous, go for a bet builder and see how we get with that. What uh, do you guys think? Yeah, what do we, what do we think? I, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure. After, be, after being the one who nailed my colours to the mast last week, I feel uh, <laughs> feel a sense of, uh, of shame over my ability to gaze into my crystal ball. Uh, sh- shall we go for the latter of those two options then, Lee? Yeah, let's go for the bet builder. Let's be adventurous, shall we? So it's under 2.5 goals. It's Thomas Party to be carded, and it's Erling Haaland to score or assist in the game, and that comes out at 15 to 2 before the boost. Right, we'll be three and one, one and three, I should say, next week, Lee. And then we'll be laughing. Then we're then we're laughing. Then we're back. Uh, enjoy the football this weekend, Lee. Thanks a million. Same to you guys. Thanks very much. Lee Phelps there on the line. Who you got is in association with William Hill. Remember, you must be over eighteen and visit gamblingcare.ie for more info. Uh, let's move on to the next game. We are looking at Liverpool versus Bournemouth. We are indeed the only person who's not calling a Liverpool win here is Jur, who thinks. Their Anfield form from last week is going to carry over. Everybody else calling a Liverpool win. 3 nils, 3 ones, 2 ones, 2 nils. Uh, Phil, what do you think? Well, it, there's a fair chance Keevan Kelleher is going to be in goal tomorrow. Yep. Arna Slot said in his press conference that Alisson has a bit of a muscle issue, which he had at the San Siro the other night. He still had a really good game at the San Siro. But it's a, it's a tricky game. I think... We'll get on to Forrest in a, a bit because I know we're trying to predict how Forrest get on. But I thought Forrest set up so well against Liverpool they couldn't break them down. I think Bournemouth won't be as... Um, don't sit in as much. They'll definitely try and attack more and that'll suit Liverpool. But that's why I fancy Bournemouth to score as well. I remember that game last season. Bournemouth scored very early in the game from a mistake... Liverpool trying to play, I think it was Trent Alexander-Arnold mm. was sloppy in possession, but Liverpool came back. And that was with Alexis McAllister getting sent off. So uh, they will concede a few chances, but I, I think they'll score. I think Salah tends to always score against Bournemouth. Especially when he hasn't scored the previous week. Yeah, he tested that crossbar at the San Siro. Twice. A couple of times, yeah. You could see how frustrated he was. Um, Jota wasn't great the other night either. I'm wondering, Nunes came on, didn't really get a sniff. Saw him in his AC Milan jersey, obviously swapped, and I thought, I can see that in the future, actually. I can see that. It looked good enough. Yeah, he's a, such a Serie A type player, isn't yeah. he? Well, I, I think La Liga and Serie A, like, there is his options. Next. What about Liverpool, though? What what happens to Nunez over the course of this season? Because I saw it remarked upon, I think it was in the Guardian, the week after the United win, where they were like, right, Arna Slot has sorted out the Gravenberg problem. On to his next mission, Darwin Nunez. Yeah, and it's still very early days. Maybe like he came back a little bit later because of the Copa America and um, we know how that ended for him, not very well. He's obviously got an international ban, but we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. He's trying to change his role a little bit, but he's definitely more suited to play a number nine role than Jota, I, I think. But um, yeah, he just hasn't had that same energy when he's come on, but that could be the way he's been told to play. Mm. And more refined, maybe in a few weeks when Jota gets his customary injury, <laughs> Nunes is put in and you start to see the benefits. Like I, I always think with Nunes, 
if he acts on instincts, it tends to work better for him. If he mm. if he has too much time, that seems to be a problem. Whereas, you know, one or two touches in the box in terms of shoot and just get the shots away, who knows? But if he, if he does actually start a few games, yeah, that's, a goal. that's what I was thinking. I think the only time that Nunes will flourish in is being told that he's guaranteed to start the next couple yeah. of games. Because we talked about this during the weekend breakfast that like he is the type of player it strikes me certainly from the outside looking in that needs the confidence of his manager. He yeah. needs to be told you're my main number nine and I trust you. Because I've always been a believer in Nunes. I think he's like technically a very good player. Like he's a good footballer. Mm. And because he's so chaotic in his overall play you wouldn't necessarily think that. And he has a great strike in him but I just don't know if he's a natural finisher. He and strikes there's, there's the ball kind of, too hard. Like there's an imp- yeah, yeah. It's, there's not, it's the opposite to Robbie Fowler. There's no accuracy in his finishing in terms no. of you know great Liverpool number nine so he's not going to be there. But he's definitely cult hero status. Like, I mean, the problem with Nunes is when he's bad, he's rotten. Yeah. And like, uh, Joe Gotta is never rotten. He can be poor, but he, he'll always contribute in some way. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, Jota can be quite sloppy in terms of the way he's running with the ball. Yeah, but off the, off, the ball, off the ball, he's very clever, Jota. Yeah. Um, Whereas Nunes isn't. And I think with Nunes, you know, like, you, you hear that people say, like, oh, they've almost struck the ball too well. You'll never see him kind of score a a scrappy goal. Like even if you were watching Leverkusen last night, Wirtz's first goal, mm. he doesn't actually hit it that well, but it's on target, so it goes in. Nunes, like when he gets, sees a side of goal, he thinks, I'm going to absolutely <laughs> smash this. Oh, oh goal. Look, there's a goal. Yeah. <laughs> Let me hit that there. Uh, there was, well, I'm trying to think what game it was last season where I think it could have been Brentford or Forest at Anfield where he was through and he thundered one off the crossbar. Yeah. Alan Shearer is the only Premier League player who's ever had that down. Yeah. You know. Um, left back, you've called, you called during the summer, Liverpool left back's a big problem. Yeah, big time, yeah. Who's plays this weekend? The Simicast doesn't stay in, does he? Because he's at fault for Christian Pulisic. Going. He's not the only one at fault, but yeah. he vacates the left back position. Yeah, he was poor. I think Kanate didn't make his mind up either. But, yeah. um, like, Simicast gets a lot of stick off Liverpool fans, but he, he was bought as the backup. He was never bought to be the number one left back. The problem, as I said during the week on breakfast, is the gap between Robertson and Simicas yeah. is smaller, but that's not because of Simicas. Robertson has come back. Right. He's just, you know, he's got a lot of he miles looks on yeah. the clock where, you know, he's had a few injuries as well. But the best thing about Robertson in the years is his energy, his ability to get up and down, up and down. But um, that's not happening as much. I'd say if Simicast plays, Antoine Semenyo for Bournemouth is rubbing his hands like he scored yeah. last week uh, away to Everton. And he plays all the time. He's one of the few players that doesn't really get subbed in the forwards for Bournemouth. I actually saw him play last year as well yeah, in person. And like he's very underrated in terms Class. of Premier League wingers. He was brilliant in that Newcastle game earlier in the season yeah. where they, they had the goal chalked off. He wasn't bad end. in the Chelsea game but they lost. No, and you know that's the thing. They do cause problems. They should have actually beaten Chelsea and they, yeah. they missed a penalty as well, Evan Nielsen. So... No, it'll be a, it'll be a tricky one. I I could see where Jar's coming from with the draw. Yeah, for sure. There'll be a bit of a nervousness around it. Like, mm. like the, obviously, it was the first time this season beating Milan with, that they've come from behind to win. But I don't know. I just find sometimes games at Anfield that are people turning up expecting them to put on a show and to win. But There'll be a better atmosphere this weekend after what happened last weekend. There surely, should be. there should be. Yeah, I think uh, it is a three o'clock game on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to the next fixture which is Brighton versus Nottingham Forest and Phil is the only person here who is calling a Forest win despite well they're both informed teams to be fair uh, Ger- John has gone for Brighton winning 4-0 in this game at the weekend which is a, a big call given what Forest did last weekend I do think Brighton will win I think that there would be a bit of a come down for Forest last weekend and it's just picking between these two informed teams the one thing I just want to ask here like Nuno and his reputation mm. ha- has been like a roller coaster. Post Wolves in very good place. Mm. Very, very early on in Tottenham, it was sort of laughing stock stuff with Nuno. And now all of a sudden it's kind of gone back the other way. The, the truth, as always, is surely in the middle somewhere, or actually is it? When he went lofty? to when he went to Saudi Arabia after Spurs, I thought that's the last we're gonna see of yeah. Nuno in Western football, mm. never mind Premier League. But I think like the likes of Wolves and Nottingham Forest suit Nuno down to the ground, like. Yeah. Um I've gone for a Desmond. I think it'll be a very, very good game. Like I love these are everyone's two kind of favorite teams at the moment. Like, yeah. 
They're cool he as young, fresh. He, yeah, he just young cool fella in charge of Brighton. And uh, Evan Ferguson played during the week as well. He hasn't played much. Yeah, so I'd be far. interested as he started. I just thought Forrest, everyone talked about Liverpool last week, but Forrest got it spot on. Yeah. Just it, like it, Nuno played under Jose Mourinho and it was a classic Mourinho performance yeah. where give nothing away and then let the, the favourites get a little bit frustrated, let them blink first and then you just pick them off you and know that's what, what they did. Forrest have a really good squad like Unbelievable the squad, substitutes yeah. combined for that yeah. win like yeah. at Anfield, you know, yeah. Anthony Langer, Ross Callum Hudson, the die. Lots of the die. Like, I remember him a few years ago at Chelsea he was constantly linked to Bayern. Like, yeah. like, they're signing serious players. Like, they're doing well with the money that they have. They um, sign a lot of players. And they're, they've <laughs> already accumulated, Forrest have already accumulated a quarter of the points total they got last season. Mm. They're unbeaten yeah. like. And they're Milinkovic, the like, centre half is very he's good. He's very good, isn't he? It just yeah. feels like year, I know that that's, obviously he, he wasn't a, a huge figure last year, not a figure at all, but it does feel like year two for a lot of these players mm. at the club and there's maybe a little bit more cohesion with those attacking options like hudson Adoy and Gibbs-White and Alanga obviously as well. It's very interesting that they're coming off the bench. Like I, at the start of the season, I would have expected them to be mm. starting and it doesn't I think that like going to change things That up. was purely tactical, tactical yeah. for last week. Right. I, he would have said, you're not starting, but this is how it's going to... And I'd say exactly how he thought it out, it played out that way. And it was perfect. That's why I say I think Forrest deserves huge credit. Frustrating as hell for Liverpool, Forrest disrupted them, but they, they got the job done. Is that and the most satisfying type of win in football? A tactical plan, masterclass away at a big team and win one yes. nil. Yes, with a counter attacking oh, goal. Yeah. Arsenal did it last week. How, as well. how, <laughs> how good does that pint taste that night? Like, that's a, that's what I told you. So pint. Yeah. <laughs> and I wonder. My only concern. I've picked Forrest, but my only concern is do you think that's ah, Brighton. We don't need to do it. Yeah, but uh, Pedro not necessarily guaranteed to come back this weekend for Brighton either. Hertzler has been talking this morning and uh, doesn't look overly hopeful. He's got injured in the, in the international break, and. Uh, I just think he's their best player. He's absolutely phenomenal. Class, but yeah. it'll be great to see a little bit more of Evan Ferguson. And also, from an Irish angle on this, Oman Bamadelli not playing for Nottingham Forest last season. Boo, bad news. Andrew Oman Bamadelli not playing for a team pushing for the Europa League uh, this season. Great news. <laughs> Same amount of minutes. Much better reputation. So there's our new right back, Andrew Oman Bamadelli for the Republic of Ireland. Uh, will we move on to the final game? And this is bad news for Arsenal and the WSL. Everybody's calling Manchester City or going for a draw. I'm picking Manchester City because I think Manchester City are going to win the WSL. Yeah, Is that fair enough logic? You gave off to me earlier for turning my back on Arsenal for picking City for the Premier League. So I'm going to throw it right back at you. I'm, I'm a neutral like... observer here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I think City are... I don't. I think this is their year to win the league. I think everything that's coming out of Chelsea is that they're obviously still absolutely stacked as a team. But I don't think anyone really knows how Sonia Bompaster is going to manage all those egos that was always Emma Hayes's like best quality is that she knew how to handle a team that had basically two starting 11s like and she's got more egos this year as well right yeah and she has more egos this year city signed Miedema she got her first goal during the week um in the Champions League Jess Park got mm. a brace as well she's like one of the best young players in England at the moment you have all the regulars in there Arsenal look a bit rubbish. They haven't clicked. They and they haven't clicked for like the last season and a bit. Um, so yeah, I think it's cities to lose, anyways. I think Chelsea know how to win, so they have that benefit to them. But I do think City have a little bit of an edge this year. I, I was reading Anita Asante who said predictions are almost impossible in the WSL because the margins are so fine, and that would justify us getting this completely wrong this weekend when Arsenal have a oh, famous yeah. win at the Emirates Stadium. Uh, but is it fair enough to just use that blunt instrument approach on this game saying that City are possibly the best team in the league and the narrative would suggest that Miedema is going to go to the Emirates and score the winner at the weekend or what, what, like, explain a little bit more why City have the edge over Arsenal in particular as opposed to just Chelsea um, I think City have the edge because they they have struggled in the last couple of seasons where Gat Garrett Taylor has made a load of signings during every summer window and they've got off to a really slow start because he's struggled to find where the best places for his players are. He's played several of them out of position and then finally it'll get to like January-ish time and he'll work out what his best team is but at that stage it's too late. Whereas this season, Miedema is only really the big player coming in that he needs to fit in somehow and if you have a combination of her... And Bunny Shaw, Golden Boot winner last year, the most prolific striker in the league at the moment. If you can work out a way to make the two of them pair up, then that's a totally incomprehensible, undeniable force. 
that in the league that I don't think any defense, no matter how good you are, is going to be able to hold down because you'll be focused on one or the other and there's no way you could probably contain the two of them. Um, so I think that's why City will have a little bit of the edge. Chelsea are in this transitional period. You know, they had Emma Hayes for over a decade. She built that club. You know, it's a bit like what Wenger did at Arsenal. The only difference is Emma Hayes went out on a high where Wenger probably should have left a couple of seasons earlier. But she made that club. She made that team. It is her baby. So there's a question mark until they start playing over what Chelsea are going to do now, how they're going to react, how the players are going to react. You know, a lot of journalists have done pre-season media out there and said that the vibes are totally different. You know, you're not going into a room kind of sitting on the edge of your seat wondering what Emma Hayes is going to say next. It's a bit more relaxed. So is that going to affect the team? Maybe it'll affect them positively. It did feel like Chelsea needed a bit of a refresh. You know, it wasn't just Emma Hayes that was a bit tired with the team. I think they were a bit tired too. Um, and obviously still incredibly successful. And also, will Sonia Bompaster focus more on Europe, which Emma Hayes could never achieve? And she's coming from Lyon. She has the record there in Europe. Is that going to matter more to her than winning another WSL title. Obviously, your first focus always kind of has to be the league, but yeah. I just have a funny feeling that she's going to turn her eyes to Europe more so. Right. City last season, well, they conceded like 15 goals in 22 games as well, so they had the defence. So if they go on and they do win the league and meet them as top scorer this trophy, would you be happy for her personally? That's a very, very unfair question. <laughs> I said this on breakfast yesterday. Miedema is the only Arsenal jersey that I have a name heard. on the back of. So it's crumpled down somewhere in the uh, bottom of your yeah, wardrobe. Yeah. So, uh, like, I I do really like her as a person. I've interviewed her before. She's very, very nice. Personally, very happy for her. I will also be crying in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is uh, this week's See You God. Enjoy the weekend's football in the Premier League and the WSL. Kathleen, Phil, Cullum, thank you for joining me. We'll see you in the same time, same place next week. Bye-bye for now. Football on Off the Ball. With William Hill. You can boost your winnings on every game with new Bet Builder Extra. Only with William Hill. Download the app today. 18 plus gamblingcare.ie This is News Talk.